I'm Yifan Lee, the publisher of Orientations, and I will be your moderator. The topic today is distilling art history. We will be speaking to our panelists on how they make sense of the past to speak to a contemporary audience and how they make history more accessible. The first of our three distinguished speakers is Julia Andrews, professor in the Department of History of Art at Ohio State University. She was a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow and has also recently received a Fulbright Fellowship. Her 1994 publication, Painters and Politics in the People's Republic of China, 1949 to 1979, won the Joseph Levinson Prize at the Association of Asian Studies as the best book of the year on modern China. The second speaker is Kui Yi Shen, Professor of Asian Art History, Theory and Criticism, Vice Chair and Director of PhD Program at the University of California, San Diego. His publications include Between the Thunder and the Rain and The Elegant Gathering, amongst others, and he has also worked as a curator on A Century in Crisis, the modern portion of China, 5,000 years, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York in Bilbao in 1998, and Reboot, the third Chengdu Biennale at the Chengdu Modern Art Museum in 2007, amongst other projects. Our third speaker is Daisy Wang, the Deputy Director of Curatorial Programming at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. She was previously the Robert N. Shapiro Curator of Chinese and East Asian Art at the Peabody Essex Museum, and the Chinese art specialist at the Freer Sackler and is a recipient of a Getty Museum Leadership Fellowship, a Smithsonian Postdoctoral Fellowship, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant. I will start with some questions for Julia and Kui Yi. What are the key traits of Chinese modern art and what lessons can we learn? But can you first define the time period that Chinese modern art refers to? Julia? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, that's a very, uh, very good question. You know, I've, I've been teaching um, Asian art history at a large public university, Ohio State University, for more than 30 years. And my perspective is very much affected by my uh, profession as a teacher. One, one purpose that I felt strongly in my early years was um, that through the inherent appeal of art, one might open the minds of students to the history and culture of major civilizations of East Asia. Although we are considered a Midwestern state, Ohio is as close to Washington as it is to Chicago. And throughout my lifetime, has been culturally more oriented to the East Coast and to Europe than to the West Coast and Asia. For our students and citizens to better understand the world in which we live, learning about Asia from all periods is essential. When I began teaching though, um, modern Asian art was not part of our discipline. And in fact, I think it was safe to say that it, um, that um, modern Asian art, with the exception of Japanese prints, began uh, ended around the uh, uh, around 1725. Um, I had spent some time at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, however, and I increasingly felt when I was beginning my teaching career that it was necessary to expand the curriculum into modern Asian art. Um, but at that time. There were not enough readings in English to make that possible. It, it was only after we curated the 1998 Guggenheim exhibition that we were able to begin using the catalog as a textbook. And in response to your question about the periodization, for um, a kind of convenience sake, we used um, the uh, Opium War as the beginning of the modern period for, uh, for purposes of that, um, of, of that text. Um, the catalog's been uploaded now for uh, free access on the Guggenheim's uh, archive, if anyone's interested. But after it went out of print, um, Kui, Kui Shen and I wrote a more comprehensive book, um, Art of Modern China, for the same uh, pedagogical purpose. For the 20th century, um, from my perspective as a, a, a professor teaching in the United States, both uh, similarities and differences with the art worlds and culture of China and my own country are very important topics. I try to explain what I understand about China to an English speaking audience. In the past five years though, um, we've enrolled many students from China and I've been really happy to see that many of them are taking art history courses, often while majoring in a more practical subject such as business or accounting. One very profound lesson I think we can learn from studying the art of modern China is the very destructive effects of war and violence on the development of society and culture. Europe suffered similarly in the first half of the 20th century. 
my own country lost many young men in the overseas wars, beginning with World War I, but Americans did not see war domestically in the 20th century. There is a lesson to be learned for the present and the future from those peoples who have suffered. We may someday as well look at the effects of epidemics and pandemics on culture. I've been wondering, for example, whether the seemingly coincidental deaths from pneumonia of prominent artists such as Chen Shizhong and Chen Guoliang at the height of their careers in the early 1920s might have been related to the global flu epidemic or some other um, uh, widespread epidemic. Whatever the reason, we can argue that it made a difference, just as the COVID pandemic most certainly is doing today. So I'll turn it over to Kwei, uh, if you'd like to answer the same. Kwei? Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, Judy already uh, answered most of the question, <laughs> actually. <laughs> But I think the uh, the since uh, the the uh, the periodization, yeah, we uh, take this uh, uh, 1840 um, opium war. This is the kind of the most of the Chinese history. Uh, the periodization for the Ch modern Chinese history uh, is stopped start from the same time. So it's <clears throat> it's a kind of convenient adoption from the history side to uh, use the uh, 1840 the opium war as the uh, division. And uh, also, we should say that uh, you know this uh, we consider the modern. Uh, this I don't know this uh, even uh, when you uh, mentioned this, uh, you, know, you are really uh, the the use kind of the historical our uh, historical the kind of periodization to de define the modern, because uh, all this modern also including the so-called contemporary here. But uh, usually we consider the modern, and we teach modern. Yeah, uh, is <clears throat> is about 1842, about 1980. And after 1980s, we consider uh, it belong to the contemporary in China. Although the, uh, the division of the contemporary and modern uh, in the other parts of the world possibly differ. So, uh, so the, this is the, the kind of the, and the, I think about the answer the question about division, uh, periodization, and about the lessons, I think the Judy, I just mentioned this. Yeah, it's just uh, quite amazing for the, for the Chinese uh, Chinese artists actually in the 20th century, uh, that's when they developed art and also the, uh, the suffered so many things. Uh, this, that's why we call this uh, in the Guggenheim exhibition organized in 1998, is the end of 20th century. We call this, this exhibition, the title the entitled is a century in crisis. So this we see this the, almost the entire modern Chinese art history, this period actually uh, we see the photos of crisis across the war is the most seems uh, important uh, this kind of the elements there. So uh, this influence our life, influence the society, and of course influence the development of the art. So um, you, you took um, the Opium War as a pivotal moment in China's history to start the, the periodization of uh, modern art. Um, could you talk about I mean, we're all quite familiar, I think, with the Opium War, but could you talk about a few big changes that happened in China at this point that you would use this as a time marker? Uh, the China, uh, the Sovietian is uh, before the Opium War, in, 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 for the last dynasty, the Qin Dynasty, or uh, plus the previous dynasties. I think the, uh, this China basically, especially in the, on the end of the, the several hundred years, uh, the kind, kind of the isolated. And uh, so the, the, the relation between China and the outside world the basically very limited. But the open wall has changed the sense of force the Chinese <coughs> people open their door. Uh, then uh, the uh, this established relation with the outside, although it's not necessary, <coughs> it's kind of the happy course. But uh, this is the uh, China uh, the finally uh, this inter, the, in the international world under the force. But it also, China started uh, from that time, we believe uh, this is China turned into the society itself, turned in, into this process of modernization. So we see the many kind of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, change, uh, kind of dramatic change that start from that time. Um, so from this point, I'd like to ask um, Daisy some questions. Um, Daisy, you were the curator of the exhibition Empresses of China's Forbidden City, which debuted at the Peabody Essex Museum. It featured almost 200 works from the Palace Museum in Beijing. 
The exhibition tells little known stories of how imperial women influenced art, religion, and court politics in the Qing dynasty. Um, did the, I mean, one, one very females, uh, famous female around this time um, is the Cixi Emperor, um, Empress, Empress Cixi, not the Emperor. Um, how does she feature in your exhibition? Or um, how did you um, make the exhibition relevant to a modern audience? Uh, thank you, Yifang, and also uh, thank you, Professor um, Kui Yishen and Professor Julie Andrews. And uh, by the way, uh, if you don't know, uh, I am a student. I was a student of Professor Kui Yishen, and I took his class um, on modern art and contemporary Chinese art. And of course, you know, one of my favorite readings is Julia Andrews' uh, book, Painters and Politics. So um, this is such a great opportunity. Um, I think, you know, going back to a question, Yifa, uh, it's very, very important to make exhibitions of Chinese art relevant to American audience when we look at exhibitions, whether it's a century in crisis or whether, you know, these are exhibitions from the Forbidden City. Of course, you know, a lot of exhibitions um, about Forbidden City sell the idea of treasures. Of course, you know, we have to also look at the idea of treasures because people want to come see precious things. Uh, they also want to come to uh, see things that are relevant to their daily life. Um, and the Empress of China's Forbidden City was um, a project we started around 2015-16. That is a very important moment in American history. If you're looking at how women were looking at themselves and how want to project themselves, and there are a lot of debates um, everywhere in the states. Um, so it was a very important moment. Although you know we conceived this vision much earlier than the the rise of this movement, uh, but we studied um, our audience very carefully. And uh, we also want to make sure, you know, the stories we're telling, although they are about people in the past, in, in, a, in a distant corner of the world, uh, we want to humanize these empresses, including Empress Dao Jitsu Shi. Uh, we also want to poke the idea of women and the power. Um, so very important uh, subsection in the exhibition, indeed, is about uh, how women um, actually, uh, how women, uh, play a very important role in court politics. Um, and of course, you know, we also want to tell stories about Cixi's, um, you know, connection and her uh, also particularly co her connection with the American women painter, Catherine Carl, and how that giant portrait, which measures about five meters in height, uh, she commissioned uh, and also created by Catherine American artist, uh, Catherine Carl, uh, the role in U.S.-China relations uh, because, you know, if you look at back 2016, 2017, 18, um, interesting development in terms of U.S.-China relations. Um, we end the show actually uh, not with a piece of art, but we end the show with a station with a long blank scroll. Uh, we put a lot of pencils there. We allow people to write down how, they're, um, how they feel about women and women's role in today's American uh, life. Um, and particularly, you know, we ask several questions about, okay, um, how do you feel about women portrait in media? Uh, what do you think about uh, women in power? And people, we thought, oh yes, people will just, you know, write down their thoughts, just like common book, but people could not stop. We actually, you know, in six months, we collected um, a hu two huge row of paper. Uh, I think accumulatedly, probably the measures about, you know, maybe like the, um, how do we say, like two foot wall, the track length, whatever. So we actually also, you know, um, sorted them out and we actually, you know, uh, organized some of the notes. You, you see, people feel this show is really personal and they, they really connect their own personal experience with um, these women living, you know, 200 years ago, 400 years ago. So it's really interesting. Um, I feel like there's more um, women-centric exhibitions um, recently, perhaps that's on because of the Me Too movement. Um, Julia and Kui, do you find that there's more interest in the, the role of women in modern Chinese art? Now, 
Like, I think you're on mute. Kui, we can't hear you. Yeah, I think that you, you can answer the question because it just involves some kind of project of the woman. Uh, uh, oh, okay. well, um, well, I think what Kui is mentioning is I, I, um, I just published an article this past year that, that I actually is, um, it is a, an updated version of a lecture I gave at Hong Kong U uh, a few years ago about uh, women Chinese artists in the 20th, uh, 20th century. But um, I, 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 I have uh, seen um, for quite some time, and, and this, is, this is predating the Me Too movement, that um, my students often want to write term papers on women artists or particularly to do some research on women artists. That, that might be a response to the, um, the sort of canonical position of, of, of women in the um, in the art history as it's as it's pr presented um, if, uh, if if you're really pushed for time uh, and you have a choice between dropping Zhao Mengfu or dropping uh, uh, Guan, uh, uh, his wife um, Guan Daosheng, Guan Daosheng uh, which one do you drop and and generally I think it it uh, it, 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 it is the the female artist who who gets dropped in those in those um, circumstances. Uh, so it's really only I, I think in the very contemporary period that that we can um, easily assemble a, a body of of, uh, of of really high quality art that we can um, put up uh, along with the male artists and 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 present a much more um, equivalent kind of kind of picture, but. There, there, there is really um, a great deal of interest among among students. Uh, there, there's also been um, a a kind of activist um, position on the part of curators that goes back uh, to the 1980s, I think, in, in which um, the the typical uh, presentation of a group of Chinese artists that you might find in that period was almost universally male, and uh, foreign curators began pushing to make sure that they didn't have a show that was um, that, that was so one-sided. And so, so I, I think some Chinese women artists got, got pulled into exhibitions that, um, that that really made it possible for them to launch their careers domestically um, by, by virtue of their activities uh, outside China in, in these kinds of, of exhibitions. So... Um, Could you give us a few examples of these female artists? Uh, well, let me see. Um, um, well, why don't you go ahead, Quay, and I'll think a little bit about that. But there, there, uh, some of them are are women artists who were um, abroad for some period of time. Uh, Yu Hong, I think, is one who's a, you know, uh, she, she was invited. Well, Yu Hong was invited into the Museum of Fine Arts Boston exhibition. Let's see, was she the only man in the, that show? The Fresh Ink exhibition? Right, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so did it take recognition overseas first before they were fully appreciated in China? Um, I certainly think that there, uh, I, I mean, I don't, want, I don't want to say that about Yu Hong herself because she's, you know, such a, um, an, an outstanding, uh, outstanding artist, but I, I uh, I, I do think that there is there has been a phenomenon, at, at least um, uh, in the '90s and maybe early 2000s, in, in which um, artists who were not recognized domestically in China um, got a lot of good press abroad, and and then as a result of that, uh, their reputations back home in China were um, were improved and began uh, they began being invited to shows that they might not have been. Previously, and it, th th this is not a new phenomenon. This this, um, this this happened back in the early 20th century with Wu Chang Shi, for example, and Qi Bai Shi, who were much more famous in Japan than they were in, in, in China and, and initially, and then um, and, and then that 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 led to them becoming uh, so famous in, in China. Um, it's probably true in other other countries as well. That recognition by uh, prominent critics of, abroad and by the market abroad can lead to um, 
an improvement in your own status. I, th I think Van, Van Gogh is, is an example that uh, foreign collectors really um, uh, brought him to the top of the uh, art, art world uh, in a way that uh, wasn't necessarily the case during his life, lifetime. So, um, so um, I guess with the more research by curators and academics and scholars on the view of art changes um, constantly, um, Kui, what is your, how, in your opinion, what has, how has the view of modern Chinese art changed while well, from the beginning of when you started teaching to now? Yes, uh, this is the, you know, the modern Chinese art history as a discipline that starts very late. It is still very new, I can say that, you know, just uh, almost in the U.S., I, I can say by the U.S., U.S. teach um, modern Chinese art history is a <clears throat> start from late 1990s. I think the, this, the, of course, the Guggenheim show is one of the kind of, the, <clears throat> we can say the important stimulation for this uh, uh, so new discipline uh, that uh, developed uh, in the U.S. But uh, I would say this developed quite fast. Uh, <clears throat> we see the recent, uh, this, the, uh, the more than 100 schools, they offer the modern Chinese art class, and although offered by uh, faculty in the different kind of disciplines. And, uh, most of them are historians, some in, they are in literature, they, uh, uh, in history, in the different kind of uh, communication or different kind of discipline, they offer certain kind of modern contemporary Chinese art uh, in the uh, in their curriculum. That's a really uh, it's a very good kind of phenomenon. We're uh, very glad to see. And uh, uh, <clears throat> for, for but for quite a long time, we don't have, even have the textbook. That's why we say this. Uh, Daisy said when he started studying on uh, the Chinese modern art history, we used the Guggenheim catalog as the, uh, the text for many years, and not until the, uh, 2012. Uh, you know, and, uh, we wrote another book, The Arts of Modern China, not, not quite widely adopted as the major reference to, for, the, for teaching of the, uh, the modern Chinese art. We also see the student uh, in, you know, the enthusiasm to the modern Chinese art is uh, quite obvious uh, in the uh, U.S. Un universities. For example, I use my own school uh, as an example. Uh, you, you can see the modern Chinese art class, actually, this is upper division undergraduate class. <coughs> it's also is a, this kind of the elective class. It's not a required class. But every time I, uh, this, uh, the, for so many years since I arrived uh, in the uh, UCSD uh, uh, since 2004, or four, Every year I teach, almost every year I teach one class of this modern Chinese art, I always have 150 students uh, in the class. So, <clears throat> so this, you can see the, you know, this in Sweden, Sweden among the students, they like to this, uh, this learn about the art of modern China. So I think, uh, and also another since in the graduate teaching, <clears throat> in the graduate teaching we see on uh, the dissertation on modern and contemporary Chinese art uh, in, in the past uh, this, uh, more than a decade, we see has uh, increased dramatically. Uh, if you look at the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the dissertation topic uh, provided by CAA, <coughs> the, uh, this, uh, the, the College Arts Association, we see the, uh, this, the, uh, the modern and contemporary Chinese art as a topic for dissertation, almost uh, on the half of the, uh, the occupy the half of the total number. So that's the quite a uh, the dramatic change we see uh, in the, uh, the field of the Chinese art history. And uh, uh, of course, there's a general trend, I think, the, not only for the art history, uh, even for the history and also for the literature, we see the more and more interest uh, into the modern contemporary period. Uh, that's also uh, this kind of become kind of general trends that we see in the, uh, in the humanities side. So we can say uh, this uh, uh, so far, and also another sense uh, is our graduates actually consider on uh, this in the on uh, the PhD on uh, this uh, the after they get the uh, the, the degree, the, the job placement is also relatively good. Uh, we see the almost all the this, uh, people you know with the distinction in modern Chinese art, they, they almost all find the job in the academic and also in the museum field. That's the very encouraging. And uh, <clears throat> this is also not, uh, if you uh, really know the field of art history, you will say it's uh, quite amazing because the many other, uh, the, in the other fields, it's quite difficult for 
uh, especially recently. So I think, that, uh, yeah, generally uh, I'm quite optimistic uh, so far, at least, but I don't know uh, when the, the next, uh, it's a decades, I don't know what happened. Thank you, Kuei. So Daisy, you started out, um, you, you mentioned you studied with Kuei and Julia, and um, you study contemporary Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> Advertisement for our... <laughs> but at one point you did um, extensive research on the archives of C.T. Lu at the Freer. Can you talk about his historical legacy and how at one time he was a major influence in how the West interpreted China's past and also the changing views of his historical legacy now? Well, thank you for this question. Um, First, I want to credit uh, Professor Shen. Um, I, I took several classes with him and his research and the Professor Julia's research and scholarship really has been an inspiration. Um, you know, they, they, they taught us and how to explore new fields in the field of Chinese art and, and, and how to, you know, um, basically think out of the box. And also at the same time, being a very thorough scholar um, and their rigorous scholarship has always been a, you know, a source of inspiration for me. Um, really, you know, um, my research in dealership um, starts with my uh, museum career. Uh, 2005, uh, I received a research fellowship at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And one of the questions I often had in my mind is, how did these things come to the museum, you know, 100 years ago or so? Um, and really that started my whole dissertation research. Um, and I would say, you know, um, about 15, 12 years ago, that was not a conventional topic in Chinese art history. Because, you know, if you look at dissertations um, back then, mostly about uh, artists or production of art, stylistic analysis, uh, time periods. Um, and my dissertation is really, uh, about the circulation and reception of art beyond the production of art. And I think it's, um, it's a fun project, but at the same time, you know, um, there, was, there was a lot of questions. There was a lot of questions about, you know, is this art history? You know, what, what exactly are you doing? Uh, but I received a lot of encouragement from my professors and my fellow researchers and curators and archivists. Um, so what it is, is, is to, to look at a, a dealer who played a very important role in the formation of many private and public collections in the United States and Europe and elsewhere. And really to look at how our dealers, collectors, museum curators and scholars together uh, construct the, the value of art. I mean, it's, it's really uh, interesting to me because, you know, you won't be surprised even today when you go to a lot of museums in Europe and Japan and in America, a lot of Chinese tourists would just say, oh, oh well, these museums looted, they store our things. Uh, but behind that, there's just more complex um, stories. And I think, you know, I was quite fascinated about, you know, fascinated by these stories. Um, but also, you know, it's very important. Uh, I think that, you know, that has been when I did I finish my dissertation in 2017. So, you know, in, in the past 10, 15 years, there also has been a trend for museums to be more transparent about, you know, the ownership history of their collection and how actually, you know, the objects end up in their collection. How do they communicate with the public? Because public is curious, not just Chinese people, but also American public. Um, recently, you know, I gave a talk um, uh, at the uh, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Uh, they're really looking at history of collecting. Uh, they're looking at dealers and all the different hands um, that played a role in the formation of museum collections. I think that there is a public, rising public interest. Um, in terms of scholarship, um, you know, I think that um, I have seen also increasing number of uh, dissertations on uh, dealers, collectors, and history of formation of important collections. Uh, so that's also very encouraging. I, I also know that uh, many institutions like the Smithsonian's for Sackler, uh, they have conducted a lot of provenance research, ownership, ownership history research, and they are actually putting a lot of uh, documents online so it become accessible. Uh, they're also currently planned to digitize uh, their vast archive uh, dealing with 
is um, collectors and dealers and history of collecting. Um, so I'm very glad to see you know, that kind of um, new understanding on this type of materials. Um, Daisy, can you just quickly go into um, a description of who C.T. Liu was and sure. And um, how, what, what did you, <clears throat> excuse me, what conclusions did you draw from your research on these archives? Um, so basically, um, as I mentioned, uh, um, he, he played a very, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a native of uh, Ch uh, China, and, uh, but he actually moved to uh, France in his uh, early career, and he started uh, a, um, uh, basically a gallery in Paris. Um, also around uh, 1915, he became a more international dealer, you know, establishing a uh, business uh, in New York. So in, in the next, I would say 40 years or so, he really played a very important role uh, in introducing uh, major artworks, including sculptures and paintings and uh, 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 bronzes and uh, murals into uh, major uh, collections overseas. Um, so um, what I, you know, the, the conclusion I had is really, uh, I think the two folds. One is, um, you know, dealers play a very important role, uh, but also, you know, I was, I was really looking at uh, the ecosystem. It's not just a dealer is really how dealers and collectors, museums and scholars uh, constructively sort of, you know, collectively construct the meaning of, of Chinese art. And they play a role in shaping uh, the interpretation and reception display of Chinese art. Thank you. Uh, Kuei Yu and Julia, are there any areas of research that you feel are still lacking for the understanding of Chinese modern art history? Or what would you like your students to see your students do more research on? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think there still remains so many areas of, of research. Um, you know, um, European and American art history and Japanese art history, uh, the, the individual artists have been thoroughly researched. There's extensive monographic material available on them. There are archives and catalog resume and so forth. And that, and that is really not the case in China. I really need um, a, a lot more work in, in so many different um, areas. One of the things that that does um, constant, that does kind of concern me is that um, um, most of the archival material that would enable us to do this kind of work um, has remained in family family collections, and many of them, uh, particularly after the ups and downs of, of recent Chinese history, um, either don't. Uh, see the value in them, or if they do, they don't know what to do with these with these materials, and and so there there's so many cases in in which um, they simply are not preserved, or uh, perhaps the best case scenario is is that they're they're auctioned off, um, but uh, that situation as well um, destroys the context of the original archive by breaking them breaking them up, and um, uh, also in most cases um, means that the work go into private collections where um, scholars and researchers may not have access to them again for, for decades. So, um, so if, um, uh, I, I, I do wish that there were more robust ar archival systems and um, special collections perhaps in, in uh, university libraries that would um, better preserve and, and make possible uh, research on, on, on these materials. Now, I know some of the institutions in Hong Kong have, have already um, been doing quite a good uh, job in, in this area, and, and, and I hope the, these good examples can, can serve as models for, um, for art, art studies all, all over um, uh, greater China. Great. Yeah, I think they also, yeah, he talked about very important archive research and things, and I think the other thing is that, how to uh, uh, go beyond the discipline of the and the art history itself, and also the put uh, much more kind of attention to the visual uh, visual culture and the visual studies, because the Chinese <coughs> Chinese uh, the the art actually developed since the uh, this last since the twentieth century, actually not uh, this the the, uh, the the how to say the uh, isolated from other uh, discipline other area. 
especially we think about the early on uh, the 20th century, that the start from 20s and 30s, we see this on uh, uh, this the, the the new kind of visual culture actually starts establishing in the Chinese society, and uh, this including on the other disciplines like the literature, uh, like the theater, like the uh, film, like the also. Uh, like the publishing industry, all these kinds of things, you know. And also during that time, I would say it's really kind of the Chinese uh, the Renaissance period. We see many so-called kind of culturemen actually uh, appeared at that time uh, in the Chinese society. Uh, these people actually, they cross the discipline, uh, they work in all different kind of the visual culture uh, areas. Uh, they are the painter, they are the designer, they are also uh, the writer, uh, the poet, and also on the, the performer in the theater and the film, we see the, this kind of very dynamic kind of the, 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 the scenario we can see created during that time. It's really fascinating. And that's why I think the study of the history uh, has to have to uh, kind of expand it to the more kind of interdisciplinary way uh, to, to see that. And uh, as uh, Daisy just mentioned, I think, you know, now the recently many kind of the the studies on like the collections and also on this kind of the patrons, patronage studies, I think they're very important. And also very um, glad to see that recently and a group of the young scholars come out, like the new publication by the Christina Ho, uh, Christine Ho, and also the like the uh, Yiku and also uh, the Amanda Wong and also the like the, uh, the Peggy Wong, all these young scholars actually work in all different kind of the, uh, subject and uh, also the, some deal with the institutional studies, some deal with the other kind of the, uh, the exhibitions, the collection, uh, uh, the collections, all these kind of things. I think it's a really uh, that's a fascinating. We see this uh, group, the young scholar, it's a really a new generation of scholar just um, it started doing an amazing job. When we write the on uh, this uh, Arts of China, it just took us the, uh, more than 10 years to, to write this, that book. But anyway, uh, although it's a kind of the, uh, the, the, the chance of build up a certain kind of structures there, but it's a lot of the holes there. I really, you know, hope uh, this, the, the, all the scholars work together, trying to gradually uh, the fill these holes and uh, give, uh, you know, trying to uh, the, give us a much kind of the complete picture of the Chinese, modern Chinese art and the let us a more kind of uh, comprehensive kind of the story can tell people. So I, I think your seminal work has been a great inspiration for this young generation of scholars um, on Chinese modern art history. But Daisy, um, why do you think the Forbidden City continues to hold people's fascination? And what would this mean for the Hong Kong Palace Museum? Well, because it's forbidden, so people are fascinated because it's a forbidden, particularly for American audience. That's why most of the uh, shows from the Palace Museum in that title, they have Forbidden City, and then they say treasures. I think these two are very, very important. It's a big place. That, yeah, it's a big uh, place that actually, you know, have an have a important place in popular imagination. Um, um, recently, um, you know, um, because I was doing several exhibitions, uh, working on several exhibitions on, uh, related to the Palace Museum collection. So, you know, we conducted a visitor research. Uh, what we did is uh, called personal meaning mapping. Um, it's, a, it's a research uh, method to basically to gauge people's gut reaction to a concept such as Forbidden City. Um, so interesting findings. Uh, so first of all, people are associated Palace Museum with treasures, with precious things. Uh, second, people are really attracted to people and people's stories, such as Empress Dao Jitsuji, you just mentioned. Those fascinating uh, personalities, I think people are very interested in. That probably has to do with popular TV, you know, dramas and, and films and, and uh, you know, novels as well. Um, they're also very interested in architecture of the Forbidden City. Um, and for, for myself, I think that is, is, is of course, the gorgeous objects. Uh, but um, to me, um, I, 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 like to, uh, I like to be a detective. I think there are so many questions spinning in my head, and I want to find the answers. Um, so I think it's that kind of mystery, is that kind of detective lens that get myself so interested in, in the Forbidden City, particularly, you know, when I, when I was working on the... Um, Empresses of China's Forbidden City show is the, you know, 
sort of untold story of the women is kind of kind of like the tantalizing process research. You kind of see a little bit traces of women, but you couldn't find because you know, the majority of the textual evidence are actually associated with men in the Forbidden City, with the emperors, not the women. But still, you can detect traces of their presence and influence. So I think that is something really fascinates me. Um, the, the second point I want to say is that um, as, as you go deeper into the forbidden city, you can really make personal connections with everything they were doing. Um, currently, you know, we're working on, um, we're planning a, a, a large exhibition to look at the daily life, basically 24 hours <laughs> in Emperor's Day. And really, you know, starting from four o'clock, he got up to the eight o'clock when he went to bed. And, you know, we look at archival documents. We look at texture of his daily life, little snuff bottles he was using, you know, his favorite recipe, uh, his birthday party, um, you know, and, and, you know, he's also, uh, we want to end the show with um, his dream. Uh, one night, you know, the emperor was dreaming about his beloved and deceased wife who died at a young age, and he has been missing her for the rest of his life. Um, so I think is is this kind of, you know, personalized and humanized story and elements that really going to uh, make people remember the Forbidden City and really to be able to make that kind of personal connection to the Forbidden City. So um, Clay and Julia, uh, Daisy mentioned a few times humanizing and making personal connections with these historical figures. Um, how important are those points in your research and projects, making personal connections? Yeah, I think of course that this the I think that, that Julie maybe I also can talk a lot about the, uh, when she did the research and the it kind of interview people that become so important. Actually, uh, we learned the lesson actually that in our uh, when we do the research about the, the modern Chinese art. I remember in the middle of 1980s we did have quite a chance to go to China visit uh, many kind of institution, including under the kind of uh, have, had a chance to interview the several kind of important art, uh, scholars and artists at the time, but every time that we think, you know, possibly, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's okay, next time we will come back again to, 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 to have a chance to talk to them. Uh, and uh, because we have so many archive research have to do and also the other things, but uh, the last one learned is never, uh, never lose any chance if you have a chance to interview people, trying to uh, use the chance to, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the, we don't know what happened uh, in the, the, the next few years. So <clears throat> I think this for the younger scholar, I always told my my students, you know, if you no matter do the archives uh, research or you when you do the research to interview uh, artists, <laughs> no matter what age, trying to get as much as possible, and uh, this then never will be too much, but always as not enough. So I think this kind of the personal connection is very important uh, in our study, especially when we study the modern, uh, modern Ch contemporary Chinese art. The good thing compared, compared to study the Tang and the Song art, you do have a chance to really meet the, uh, the, the creator of the artworks. So you should uh, you know, use this opportunity uh, to get the first hand materials. And uh, the later, no matter what uh, this, the, in your life, you will use them anyway. So I think that's the kind of things I think that I will I always told my student. Yeah, Ellen, no, I, I, that, I, that's, that's really, really true. And, and one of the things that I think um, is, is so important is, uh, are, are the commonalities among, um, I mean, art, art is part of the humanities and, and the commonalities among, uh, Human beings everywhere, you know. E even when you, um, uh, when in the past, uh, I, particularly in the eighties, I, I would talk to artists about the, the really difficult times that a lot of them had in the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, and trying to, um, trying to find their way in an art, art world that was, um, uh, in in which they didn't really. Uh, uh, always have control of what they wanted 
of, of what they were allowed to do or, or wanted to do. But, um, uh, but, but when you look at uh, artists struggling and trying to make a living in the um, New York art world, um, the kinds of obstacles they encountered were, were different, but um, they were just as intense and um, often uh, led to unexpected directions in, in, in their art. So the, um, the, the, the struggles that those who have this passion to be an artist, to express themselves, they, uh, one commonality is they, they all want their work to be seen, whether it's seen in an exhibition, whether it's ex uh, published in a magazine. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's often the, the most um, gratifying part of, of, their, of their projects. So regardless of whether uh, you're wanting to be the best socialist realist painter of the 1960s or the, the greatest abstract expressionist of, of the New York school or whatever. There, there, um, there, there, there are indeed um, so many commonalities and, and so many ways in which um, their experiences uh, are, are, are similar and, and their art touches lives in their own societies. Um, so as art historians uh, dealing with such a vast extent of material, I, I think you do need to distill art history to make it more palatable to the modern audience. But how do you keep yourself from putting your own or too much of your own bias on events? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, it's a very, very good question. So also, it's a very good point here. And as an art historian, we, uh, we uh, deal with this, uh, you know, we, both you can see, we, uh, our studies also work on the, not only modern, sometimes also touch the contemporary. And uh, as possible, of course, we also have our own, uh, this kind of the, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic taste or <laughs> a certain kind of opinion to the certain kind of art or certain kind of phenomena in this. But I think that as a historian, is a, definitely we have to uh, respect the facts. That's the key thing. Uh, you know, uh, this, the, we always say, you know, some artists I really like. Uh, this, sometimes I like the artist, not necessarily the artworks, his works. Uh, sometimes I like, like the artworks, not necessarily like this artist. So, uh, but you know, in this kind of case, you have to really just uh, look at the facts and look at the co context there. Uh, and uh, to us, as our historian, most important things, we look at the artworks, they made a contribution to uh, the form, the history. Uh, in the process of con uh, constructing history, uh, these works or uh, these artists make the import important contribution. We just uh, have to uh, study them and represent, represent them in the history. So that's why I you know uh, same thing. I, I also work as a curator on this quite often to organize exhibitions that will deal with the same kind of issues. Uh, that you know uh, you definitely have your own kind of the taste, own choice there. But on the other hand, uh, as our historian involved in these kind of the, on the uh, curating uh, work, I think uh, the most important thing is to look at what uh, we think this uh, artist or this, uh, these artworks and uh, the, 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 their contribution to the history. Thank you. Julia, quite, uh, Daisy, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I, 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 I think you do have to, um, you know, be thoughtful of your own bias uh, because all, all writers um, have this. Uh, I think to some degree, when Quay and I are working together, we, um, we tend to uh, uh, bounce our ideas off, off one another so that some of those biases become a little bit more transparent by virtue of, of talking through them. Um, uh, although they're not necessarily what you would expect. I, I've been crazy about Chinese art since I was an undergraduate and Clay has been crazy about Western art since he was an undergraduate. So, um, so we, 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 we come, uh, our, our, our prejudices are, are perhaps the opposite of what you might, uh, might expect. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but one thing is we do, um, one bias we share perhaps is we, we have relatively similar taste in what kind of art we like, just um, what, are, what are just fundamental response uh, on a 
on, 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 on aesthetic and not, not necessarily on an intellectual level might, might be. So, um, so that makes working together relatively easy. So Daisy, I think you're preparing for the opening of the Palace Museum. And I, I, I remember you saying there's going to be nine opening exhibitions. Yes. So um, can you tell us more about what these nine exhibitions compose of? Um, what are they going to be about? Yes. Yes. Um, so for our grand opening uh, in um, summer 2022, uh, which is about 20 months from now, uh, we are uh, actively planning on nine exhibitions. Um, two are special exhibitions, which means they're temporary, they're shorter um, uh, duration, uh, about three to uh, six months uh, time of display. And the rest of exhibitions will be there for um, one year or longer. Um, out of nine galleries for the opening uh, exhibitions, uh, we have um, seven uh, exhibitions that are mainly uh, drawing on the loans from the Forbidden City. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I want to give you a, a happy surprise <laughs> is that uh, we're going to perhaps borrow the largest um, loan ever um, that Palace Museum lent out to a single institution in one go. So, you know, there's just a lot of excitement and a lot of work that we need to do. Um, our exhibitions will be very diverse in its approach and content and presentation, as well as um, the target audiences. Um, so diversity is very, very important for us. For example, you know, we're, we're uh, looking at more conventional kind of, kind of treasure type of exhibitions or, you know, art, more art historical type of exhibitions. We're also looking at, for example, you know, more innovative exhibition, uh, more immersive experience, inviting visitors to experience um, the Emperor's Day in, in one gallery, as well as we have an, a gallery devoted to uh, children and their families as well. Uh, in terms of the quality of artworks, um, uh, we're borrowing a lot of the top tier um, iconic objects from the Palace Museum. Uh, for our opening exhibitions, uh, one of the um, destination exhibitions will be uh, 30 early paintings and colloquial pieces um, from the Palace Museum's collection. Uh, the majority of them are a Song and Yuan uh, dynasty paintings and good works. So we expect, you know, that will be become a, a major draw for our audience. Um, this is called the Hong Kong Palace Museum. What, what do you think the Hong Kong audience is most interested in? Um, I think that uh, you'll be surprised how diverse if we talk about the Hong Kong audience uh, sure. based on you know our research that you know Hong Kong is a big uh, metropolis. Uh, it's very very diverse and international. Uh, we have tourists from all over the world from mainland China. We have uh, local fans of museum um, museums and art and culture. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the, the reason I mentioned diversity is that we're dealing with a very, very diverse Hong Kong audience. There's no one Hong Kong audience. It's just very, very diverse um, people in the mix. For example, you know, we're, we're expecting about 70% uh, local residents. And the local residents, remember, these are, you know, it's very diverse. You know, we have, um, you know, I am a resident. I'm not a, you know, I'm not, I wasn't born in Hong Kong. I work here. Um, and um, we also expect uh, 30 um, uh, international uh, visitors um, from elsewhere. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting and important also thinking about the cultural differences. Think about the languages, right? In the States, uh, you know, we mostly do English captions and labels. And, you know, if you have resources, you do a little bit of, you know, Chinese language text. Um, but here, everything is, is bilingual. And sometimes, you know, we also have, um, we, in addition to classical Chinese, uh, classical Chinese text we use, and sometimes we all, sometimes we also have to think about simplify the Chinese. So it's just a very, I think it's very exciting um, project, but also, you know, we just have a lot of work to do. So we're all looking forward to the opening. Thank you. Uh, Julian and Kwai, what, what projects are you working on at the moment? <clears throat> 
Well, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, uh, some uh, short essays right, right now, um, uh, all of which center around the, the problem of uh, the connections between the Chinese art world and the world outside. So one, uh, one, uh, one piece that I'm trying to get finished is a study of uh, the French artist André Clodeau, uh, who taught at the um, academies in Beijing and Hangzhou in the early 1920s. Uh, or, yeah, uh, no, sorry, the se second half of the 1920s, and um, had, I think, a big impact on, on his students. Um, and then I'm also uh, looking at some of the uh, Japanese oil painters who traveled to China and were um, powerfully affected by what they saw in China and, and, their, and their work. Uh, so, um, and then a few other things on the back burner about uh, re Republican period um, uh, ink painting. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, quite a yeah, multiple project is always uh, <coughs> together all the time. But anyway, as a one that's an important project, actually, uh, the, the Judith mentioned that she's writing on this uh, Crodo. Actually, this uh, is the uh, belong to the one large project I'm working on as a co uh, editor, uh, co kind of uh, the yeah, uh, the the editor of this uh, uh, anthology is called Entangled Modernity. Actually, the main this project is funded by uh, Getty Museum, uh, Getty Foundation, uh, but organized by the University uh, of the Heidelberg in Germany you know, by the Professor Sarah uh, Fraser and with the group of the scholar, uh, uh, including US scholar and also the, uh, the uh, Chinese scholars. So the, this uh, project actually started from uh, three years ago <clears throat> to four years ago, to 2017, and uh, organized the group, the scholar, and uh, uh, including many kind of PhD students uh, involved in this project. Uh, we uh, went to Europe and uh, mainly this project that studied uh, uh, Chinese art artists that studied in Europe during the 1920s and 1930s. Although this is a, it's not the kind of the brand new kind of project, many scholars already start to work on this, but uh, the, we hope that uh, we can, uh, the, the, through this project, we can do, give the more kind of comprehensive picture and a more deep kind of research about this very important group, the artists that they played a very important role in the, uh, the, the in the, the, the process of modern Chinese uh, the art uh, the formed in China later in the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s in this period. So uh, this, the, this, uh, the book project uh, included uh, the more than 16 on uh, this, the essays uh, in, the, uh, in this. Uh, so on this, um, Professor Sarah Fraser and me, we are the co-editor for this, uh, this, uh, on this anthology. So we are working on this, and we hope uh, this will be very interesting because including many uh, the curators in the uh, European museums and also the uh, scholars. Uh, this, the, they already uh, spent quite a uh, few years uh, studying on this uh, subject. So we, we hope we'll bring the very interesting kind of research uh, the, the, to, to, the, to the people later. Thank you. Uh, we've almost out of time. The hour's gone by so fast. Thank you for sharing your experiences and knowledge. Uh, we're looking forward to opening up the Palace Museum and to also reading your new research, uh, Kui Yi and Julia. Um, I'm very happy to be moderating this talk and um, we've had the pleasure as well at orientations to have worked with all three of you and I hope to see you all soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.